Welcome to Curious Things presentation on reimagining the patient's journey with voice AI. My name is David McKeag and I'm a co-founder of Curious Thing, which is a venture funded voice AI company located in Australia. Uh, hence for this presentation, you are going to hear some Australian accents. The health industry has historically been a difficult industry to sell into uh, with new technology. Uh, it's typically uh, conservative, uh, fragmented, has poor alignment of stakeholders um, with, and with difficult integrations between fragmented systems. But something has started to change in voice AI and the patient's journey. And this presentation today is around that change. A weird curious thing have found a why now moment has occurred. Uh, sometimes markets don't change. Um, you know, just having new technology is not enough. Really, uh, what you really need is some sort of major shift in the propensity to adopt new technology. We have seen a major shift in buyer behavior uh, in the adoption of voice AI uh, in the health industry. And this is the, the story of the message that we wanted to share today. The pandemic uh, kicked off for us in Australia um, a, a shift in health adoption of digital tech. Clearly health has had digital tech, but uh, for voice AI, um, it, it's typically been uh, an industry laggard. Um, the Australian health system is actually complicated. It's a complicated state-based uh, regional local uh, system, but it's not as complex as North America. Uh, we started actually with our first application, which wasn't patient critical and was around a state-based application for checking in with businesses around COVID practices. Then what happened with the pandemic was that uh, we saw, uh, not for us, but we saw in general, the adoption of telemedicine, uh, which went first. So other applications where, where the behavior was started to shift, major behavior between doctors and remote patients. Uh, from there, it evolved, uh, both the pandemic involved and also the adoption. Uh, evolved as well. Uh, one of the things in, in the next wave was how do we enable patients to isolate at home but under the care of the hospital? Uh, so the patient at home use case. Uh, these behavioral changes, what we saw was not extending the doctor, it was extending the nurse. How do we actually, the nurse and the carer, how do we extend the nurse and the carer uh, to uh, broader scale adoption to people in the community. One of the quotes, which is actually on this from one of the, our patients, um, it, it made me feel like I wasn't alone, was from a patient at home who was isolating with COVID-19. An important aspect was having a broad range uh, of, of reach for demographics. Uh, we also have found uh, that we could reach high male participation uh, and actually 60 to 90 year olds. So we could reach actually, and this is an important aspect in hospitals and health systems is reaching uh, the unreachable. Uh, this continued to grow in adoption across a series of use cases throughout the patient's journey from being at home to longitudinal research over time. Today, we wanted to share some of our use cases and also where we are going to in the future. So today we have two speakers, myself, David McKeague, uh, who is a co-founder of Curious Thing, um, but I will uh, invite uh, Rick Johnson to uh, present, uh, who will uh, talk to these use cases uh, in, in more detail. Um, uh, so to, to, uh, to share more information, more details about each of these use cases. The presentation is really in four parts. Uh, there's the introduction, so we will tell you a little bit more about uh, who we are. Uh, secondly, was what's different about us? Um, and this is, you know, you know, we're all in the business of uh, building voice AI systems, but 
uh, what is the, the, the differentiator or the difference. We will uh, look at four use cases uh, and um, I will come back and then we will be talking about what's next uh, in, in what we see is coming next. So let me just introduce a little bit more about Curious Thing. So as I mentioned, Curious Thing is a venture funded startup uh, that's in, in Australia. Uh, we are pioneering uh, the, the world of um, its, its information discovery with uh, voice AI. We do have a vision uh, and our vision uh, in health is, is to extend the medical professional the, uh, so which is the photo here, the nurse, the carer, uh, not necessarily the doctor. So the doctor, you know, is, is, is a different use case. One of the things that we've learned, and I'll sort of come back to this, but I want to just make sure we, you know, cover, um, is uh, whenever we've done the work, we co-develop it with clinicians. Uh, this is really important uh, to clinicians, uh, the people who are asking the questions and developing, you know, the medical efficacy. Um, and so it's not, you know, us just building it on our own. Uh, the, the, the fourth point uh, here is the compliant. The, within health, we, so we, you, any health application needs quite uh, all of the normal cloud uh, vendor certifications, but in health, uh, HIPAA compliance is, um, is critical uh, to the application. So what's different about Curious Thing? Uh, typically, uh, voice systems uh, uh, are intent-based uh, systems. Um, what we have pioneered is the, um, the concept or the technology of purposeful information explorer. And you'll, you'll gain a feel actually for that uh, in one of the demos. But basically there are topics uh, and there's information that needs to be covered actually in each topic uh, as it's questioning and asking questions. The questions can be uh, both binary, but also can be qualitative uh, questions as well. So, the four use cases that we wanted to cover today include uh, the patient at home, uh, which we've, I've alluded to a little bit, uh, waitlist management, patient follow-up, uh, and medical research. And on that note, I will pass over to Rick. Thank you, David. Uh, so yes, as David mentioned, our story is going to take us back into the depths of the COVID-19 pandemic to start with, um, which proved to be an incredible opportunity for this industry for voice AI to really come to the fore, particularly extending the capacity of the health system and nurses um, especially. So let's get stuck into the four use cases. I'll go to the next slide. Thanks, David. Thank you. So during the height of the pandemic in Australia, different states experienced peaks at different times and they were employing uh, different strategies for how they were going to deal with the, the additional strain on the system. The first state agency that we partnered with had decided to have any of their low or moderate risk patients recover at home, supported by take-home devices like pulse oximeters. In sending them to recover at home though, the health team didn't want to lose sight of how people were faring or how their health or their risk was changing while they were at home. So the challenge for them was how do they keep monitoring patients at home, keep talking to them when they have finite clinical and support staff and thousands of people in isolation on any given day? Before I tell you how we solved that, um, I'll talk a little bit, bit about the second state who came to us with the challenge. Their problem was that they had a huge spike in new cases and they couldn't get through to speak to everybody to find out who was actually at risk of having severe COVID. So they wanted to be able to conduct a risk assessment so that the human team could instead spend their time supporting just the patients who were vulnerable in isolation, whether for health or social or safety reasons. Um, the health team wanted to be able to then reassure the rest of the cases that they were low risk and they didn't need to worry and provide them with the materials and support they needed to recover at home and also provide them with a pathway back into the health team if their situation should worsen. 
In both of these cases, this was about helping the nurses to pinpoint in amongst all of this low risk patient noise where the real need was. It was also about helping to scale their oversight so that rather than spending the time gathering information, the team could spend the time making decisions based on the information that had been gathered. And this is where voice AI played a critical part. In both of the cases, as David mentioned, the conversation was designed by the clinical teams. They know what clear black and white questions they need to understand to be able to make good decisions. They know which combinations of responses identify by somebody as being a higher or lower risk. And they had to figure out what the process was going to be for their clinical team to be a human in the loop, reviewing those outcomes and reaching out same day where there was a problem. So here's what happened. For problem one, just jump onto that next slide, David. Thank you. So for the first problem, we created a daily check-in call for the health team to be able to monitor those recovering at home. As I said, the questions were designed with the agency, but they covered not just health elements, but also general social wellness. Uh, do you have access to the medication that you need or to the groceries that you need when you can't leave the house? What this team did particularly brilliantly was that they introduced this call on the second day of home isolation through to the end of isolation, creating space for their team to be able to contact with their uh, human nurses, call all these people on their first day of isolation. Then they could assess the risk of that person, check for social support needs, and they could introduce the AI so that there was no surprise for that patient. They set up the expectation that Sam, the AI, was going to be calling people between 11 a.m. and noon every day, asking the same questions, and then inform them what was going to happen to the data once they answered those questions. Because of this expectation set up, we saw that 85% of the calls that we made were answered and completed by these patients. We designed it really carefully to be low effort for the customer. If you're going to have the call every day, you want to make sure that you're not taking too much time. So we made sure it was less than three minutes. We let them know that the call was coming by sending a short message beforehand so they could take their pulse oximeter readings. So all in all, over the duration of two weeks, each patient spent less than 30 minutes total speaking with Sam the robot. But every day, it gave them a pathway back into the clinical team if they needed help. At the end of this campaign on the last day, the AI itself, Sam asked people how they felt about speaking with robot. And the results were kind of incredible. 85% of people said that they were satisfied or very satisfied with the AI support they received. And the reasons that they gave, like the quote you see here and the one we had at the start of this deck, are entirely human reasons for valuing the program. They felt less alone. They felt supported. They felt like they hadn't been forgotten in this big, noisy health system. We'll jump onto the next use case now, which was risk stratification. And the outcomes here were amazing. Over six weeks time, we were supporting around about 100,000 citizens. Um, what really strikes me here is that of those 100,000, only 20% of them were identified as being higher risk. So the other 80% were able to be reassured on the call with our AI that they were low risk and here's how you could support yourself at home. It's actually the smaller numbers in this use case that I found really interesting. 1.5% of people were concerned about their safety or their ability to provide adequate care to their families while they were in isolation. And that number is pleasingly small. But with that tiny volume, how would the clinical team ever find these people if the AI hadn't been able to speak to them? Uh, it really drove home for me that what we're looking for in these cases where there's lots of volume is we're looking for where there is human attention needed. And it's like finding needles in a haystack. You know, there's lots and lots of volume and very few people with need, but we connect them. And the last thing that was really interesting was the tiny number on the right that 127 people were abusive to our AI. Our AI was called Billy for this case, and we know that Billy doesn't have feelings, but the clinical team that would have taken these calls without the AI, they have feelings. So this means that 127 times at the height of the pandemic when everybody was stressed and their tempers were frazzled, these human clinicians 127 times didn't have to be abused by a patient. And I think that's really powerful um, for how we support clinicians in times of stress as well as patients. Across each of these cases, the pandemic gave patients and clinicians a forced opportunity to try voice AI as a support channel and the results were great and the patient feedback was really positive. And that's what's led up to an increased willingness to adopt voice AI as part of the overall patient journey. So next, let's talk about something non-pandemic. 
The next problem we had was around wait list management. And this is around outpatient uh, outpatients waiting for um, operations and procedures. And depending on the procedure, the wait can be quite long. During the time that the patient is waiting, a few things can happen to them. They could choose to go and get treatment from a private facility or they could recover in some circumstances or they could move away out of jurisdiction or they could pass away. And this information doesn't always reach the hospital booking the appointments. So when their appointment rolls around, the patient is a no-show. No-shows prevent other patients from getting that treatment. They're expensive. They're frustrating. It's a complicated system. So what we're able to use AI to do is to call everybody on a wait list to check that they still need the procedure. Also, to, as we get closer to the day, we can make another call and let them know what they need to do to prepare, make sure that they're in good health and able to attend. Uh, and set the expectations for them about what that, that appointment will look like. So all of this is increasing contact points that it's just not feasible with finite human resources. And ultimately we're able to speed up treatment across the entire list. So to make this real, I thought we'd share a quick demo of it. So I'm gonna introduce you to my friend, Stevie, uh, who is an Australian AI doing waitlist management. Hello, Rick speaking. Hi, Rick. My name is Stevie the digital administration support bot at the health department. This is a quick call to check in on your current availability and readiness for an upcoming appointment. This call will take less than three minutes. Just before I begin, can I please confirm I'm speaking with Rick Johnson? Yep, that's me. Okay, thanks. You are currently on the waiting list for treatment for your knee replacement. Today, I have some short questions to help us understand your current condition. Please answer each question with a clear yes or no response. If you need me to repeat anything, you can just say, please repeat the question. To start, can I please confirm that you have been referred to the Good Orthopedic Clinic? Uh, yes, that's right. All right. Are you still requiring an appointment with this service? Yes, I am. Appreciate the answer. Next, to help us understand your condition, I would like to ask about your comfort. On a scale of one to 10, where zero is no pain and eight or above is severe pain, how much pain are you experiencing today? Um, probably like a, like a six or a seven today. Thanks. Since your referral to the orthopedic service, would you say your pain is the same increased or decreased? Uh, it's, it's, Probably, it's increasing a little bit, I think. Okay. Have you been referred to a physiotherapist? Yes, I have. I've got a good one. That is really good news. How many appointments have you had with your physiotherapist relating to this condition so far? Probably half a dozen. All right. Last section now. I would like to know more about your mobility. Can you walk without assistance? Uh, yes, most days anyway. Great. Thank you very much for sharing this information with me. Our clinical team will review your responses to help them determine the timing of next steps, and we will be in touch with you when an appointment becomes available. In the meantime, please continue to follow the advice of your doctor. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye for now. Thank you, Stevie. And so you can hear that that gives us the opportunity to gather a lot of different data for the clinicians to then be able to work out who to remove from the wait list, uh, who to accelerate on the wait list because their situation's worsened or who maybe needs to speak to somebody before a decision can be made. Um, so just one example of the types of conversations we're having. I'll move now into one of my favorite ones of our use cases, which is working with a quit tobacco service. So one of our state-based services wanted to try out AI to see how the customers would respond. Uh, and the problem they identified was their feedback loop. So once people leave a quit program, uh, it's fairly infrequent that the, the quit team have enough capacity to reach out proactively to see if people actually stayed quit and what helped them most about the program. They know that quitting is really hard and people have to try quite a lot of times. And they also know that reaching out proactively increases the customer's likelihood of deciding to try again. There's that positive little push in the right direction. So putting these things together, we designed a conversation to get feedback on the program, to ask the person if they would, had been successful in quitting, and if they hadn't been, to offer to connect them again to a human counsellor to see if they're ready to try again. 
Now, interestingly, more than 70% of these people wanted to speak to a counsellor again. And it may be that they wouldn't have proactively reached out just yet if we hadn't uh, made the first step for them. The number's big and it has potential long-term health and financial implications, both for the individuals as well as for the state quit program. Uh, in, interestingly as well, the next focus for this space is now actually after hours support. So the conversations that counsellors have after hours when people call through and need a boost are really structured and they're designed to help the individual think through their reasons and their strategies to, to stop smoking or get through the night. What was surprising about this is that the suggestion that those quite personal calls could be handled by AI came from the counsellors. The counsellors themselves said that this, you know, they'd been watching the feedback coming through from users and they identified that this was so structured that AI would be perfect and increase the number of people they could support after hours, which is pretty cool. And the last thing I'll share before I hand back to David is around medical research support, which is just starting to emerge for us. Um, medical research like pharmaceutical trials or long-term monitoring after a health event like a heart attack or stroke can be really difficult. It's costly. It's hard to be consistent when you've got humans asking and capturing information. Um, and it's not always convenient for participants to on the researchers' time to be around for a phone call or to come in to see them. So it's complicated problems. What we've been asked to co-design here is something that addresses all of these points. Firstly, the survey gathering research data, they, they're always very structured. So we're working with the researchers to make sure it's set up to be asked in exactly the same way every time, and that the data will be captured in exactly the same way every time, making it easier for the research team. On the participant side, we're co-designing with program participants because we want to make sure it's structured in a way that feels good for them. How long should the calls be? Should we split long surveys into multiple calls? How much notice do they want from an SMS before the call or how much time to call back if they miss it? Those sorts of things make this participation more on the participants' terms rather than driven by when is convenient for the researcher. The job AI is doing here is gathering the data in a way that's patient-focused and research-approved. We do the gathering so the researcher can be served the data to do the analysis and interpretation. So I think voice AI has these amazing benefits for the patient journey around consistency and convenience, around patient centricity and extending the reach and capacity of the medical professionals. What I think is also important in this space is accessibility. So one of the things that we're focusing on at the moment is figuring out how AI can be tailored to support people with speech difficulties following a medical event. Um, we're working with the health professionals on this to understand, particularly for longitudinal studies, how can you make sure you're able to include people who have different communication styles? And the next thing on accessibility is around multiple languages, which is a good point for me to throw back to you, David. Thank you very much, uh, Rick. So um, one of the things that I wanted to emphasize was um, the clear, the, the co-design with clinicians, um, the never surprising patients uh, with the experience with the voice AI. So uh, both from building a, a personal caring experience, but also uh, for them never to be uh, surprised about you know, a voice AI uh, conversation, uh, never pretend to be a person. Um, the, um, there are some new needs that we are seeing um, that are coming up for us. So one aspect is new languages. Uh, within the health uh, systems, having multiple languages to support, so reach to all, um, all demographics is critical. So uh, we're, we've got a whole program around that. But also uh, we're extending the number of use cases. So medication management, uh, appointment management, inbound patient support are all example use cases which we're coming out with. The, um, so in final, uh, what I would like to say is we have hit a why now moment for voice AI adoption in health. There is an opportunity to reimagine a scalable patient's journey from the hospital, checking in, waitlist management, um, uh, programs like um, quit smoking, all the way through to health research. Uh, if you're interested in a demo, um, we've put up the link here and we would uh, really love to hear from you uh, to show you what's possible. Thank you.